Thank you. All right. Well, let's get going, everybody. I, uh, since we are recording this and we can use this for various things, I'll introduce myself as John Kodosky. I'm a clinically practicing orthopedic trauma physician assistant and the medical science liaison for Arbutus Medical. So let's get into a case of the day here where uh, we talk about a patient that I've actually seen. So this is a 19 year old male who has a past medical history of ankylosing spondylitis who presents to the uh, trauma a resuscitation unit, also known as the true, with a deformity to his left lower extremity and an open wound to his medial knee on that side. The patient does not remember what happened, but per report, he was involved in a motor vehicle collision, presented with the deformity of the left leg and a uh, laceration of his left knee. X-ray showed that he had a subtrochanteric femur fracture and a concern for a left open knee joint, so ortho was consulted. I don't have a picture of the actual wound, so I went to Shutterstock and found the only knee photo that I could, uh, and uh, it was very grainy, so I apologize for the, the quality of it, but it, this gentleman's knee laceration was right here. Uh, it was on the medial aspect of the knee, and it ended right at the proximal portion of the knee joint and ran across and then came anteriorly this way, so I hope you enjoy the graphic. Here is his in uh, initial x-ray in the emergency room. What we see is a uh, subtrochanteric femur fracture. So right here is a lesser trochanter. Right here is the greater trochanter. Here is a femur fracture. This is a butterfly fragment that has come off on the medial side. We see that his hip is still intact. The femoral neck is still intact. And it is only the femoral shaft in this image that is compromised. So he ended up going for a CT scan where we can see this is the sagittal, so this is looking from the side. So right here is the hip portion. This is the proximal portion of the femur, and this is the distal. And the reason that I wanted to show this disparity is because this is what femurs do. Femurs drop posteriorly. So you have to imagine this is the patient's butt right here, and this, this is them laying down. This is the board this way. Looking at them in the front, so here is where we're taking slices going from nose to toes. We can see here's the greater, greater trochanter and just starting the femoral neck. And we see the shaft here. We can't even see the fracture line here. And we get kind of a scout image right over here that's very similar to what we talked about. But what I, I really want you to see here is the line of how shortened this is. Oops, I'm clicking, sorry. Sorry, clicked and I'm trying to use my mouse. I apologize. Right here, like this should be straight across. So you can see exactly how shortened that knee is right there. And I just thought that was kind of interesting that we could kind of see the degree of how much the femur is shortened. And whenever you see something like this, it makes it very obvious as to why traction is needed and exactly what traction is going to do for us once it's applied. So I wanted to include something in this case of the day that we have never included before. And this is the actual skeletal traction pin placement procedure note. So this is a note that I developed into what we call a dot phrase, and it's something that we can type in and type dot traction pin, and it will pull this up and it gives us a few key things that we can change for right or left, tibial or uh, um, femoral. And in this case, our patient got a femoral traction pin, mostly because because of the knee laceration, which we'll talk about here again in a second. But I wanted to lay out all of the key points here that we need in our documentation, and it really kind of lays out exactly what the procedure is and what we did. So we discussed the risks and benefits of the procedure with the patient, who interestingly enough um, has been in a very bad accident and doesn't recall uh, what happened there. So there can be some kind of questions as opposed to, uh, some kind of question is, is the patient lucid? Are they with it? Are we able to uh, actually consent them? And in this case, yes, we were. They expressed understanding, gave verbal consent. And he was provided with adequate pain medication. The leg was prepped and draped in a standard sterile fashion, which in our case means that we use chlorhexidine and sterile towels to drape everything out. The landmarks were then marked out, including the medial and lateral joint line, superior pole of patella and adductor tubercle. 10 cc's of lidocaine was used to anesthetize the skin from one centimeter superior to the adductor tubercle. And then the needle was advanced to the bone and the local anesthetic was injected subperiostally. From the medial aspect of the leg, a sterile two millimeter stymen pin was advanced through the skin down to the femoral shaft. Drill was used to advance the pin bicortically through the femur and the skin of the lateral leg. The leg was then in neutral rotation throughout the procedure to avoid injury to the femoral artery. Tension was applied to confirm adequate placement. 
A traction bow was then placed and 15 pounds of weight were applied in order to apply inline axial traction of the leg. Patient tolerated the procedure well, no immediate complications, and he was neurovascularly intact post-procedure. So that's a very comprehensive note that details pretty much each step of what we're doing and why. And here are some x-rays of the actual traction pin. And quite honestly, this is about darn near perfect. Now, these x-rays were taken almost immediately after skeletal traction was placed. So we haven't gotten very much of a reduction here on getting this back out to length quite yet, but it is drastically improved as to what we saw on those initial. And we can see here that these two ends are almost completely lined up on our lateral view. And we have the lateral shot of the pin going right through the, the center of the intermedullary canal. So that's a nice pin. We're really happy with that placement there. We take this patient to the operating room. We go ahead and insert our uh, long cephalomedullary nail that stabilizes the fracture and we're all done. So that makes it all seem really simple. And part of the reason that I wanted to present this case and, and what makes this one a little bit more unique is uh, for those of you who have come and visited me here in the fine state of Texas in the beautiful city of Holotus, you've driven past this location where this young man was hit. This happened less than half a mile from my house to the entrance of our subdivision. And when I talked to him in clinic, he remembered very clearly what uh, had happened. He was driving past the Frisbee golf course on the way to my house. So I don't know if, uh, Mike, you remember that or Derek, you remember that coming by. And the gentleman was, was pulling out in, in a truck and he was in a car. And the guy in the truck looked right at him. They made eye contact and he pulled out right in front of him at 50 miles an hour. Boom. And he sustained this. So... My point in sharing that part of the story is this is very real. These things are treating our friends and neighbors, unfortunately. They're treating members of our community, so this is kind of a big deal. But uh, kind of tugging at the heartstrings there a little bit and bringing it a little closer to home, that much I fully admit. But it, it really is important to remember that we're doing this to people and not necessarily patients. There's certainly uh, our customers are the hospitals, but the people that we're putting these into are definitely not our customers. We're trying to make people's lives better, which is why we do it. Now, I did want to jump back and kind of talk about a couple of uh, other things while we're here. Um, we always have the choice of choosing between a distal femur or a proximal tibial pin. Given that this gentleman had the knee laceration, we were very fortunate that we were able to use the the distal uh, femur option, this does apply more force to the fracture and be able to give us more traction and essentially make the weight more effective in what we're doing. And uh, we could have done the proximal tibial. However, with that size of a laceration and it did go through the knee joint, we kind of want to avoid that whole area just to be safe all the way around. Um, I can tell you that I saw this gentleman follow-up clinic at two weeks out. He's doing remarkably well. He is able to put uh, some pressure on the leg. I asked him if he remembered the skeletal traction pin going on, going in, and he laughed and said, no, <laughs> he didn't remember much of anything. Things were moving pretty quickly for him. So I count that as a win because had it hurt really bad, I'm sure he would have remembered it very clearly and he did. So we're going to say no news is good news because we're a positive kind of people. <laughs> so that's kind of what I got for right now. It's kind of a quick one. I'm more than happy to take any questions and talk about anything y'all want to talk about. Thanks for that, John. It's Mark here. Um, well, you said you have to make an, make sure you're uh, clearly away from the femoral artery. Is that the x-ray, CAT scan, or both that helps you determine that? Where it, it really, none of the above. It has everything to do with procedure and landmarks. And one of the big things that I have always pushed on our education side is the landmarks were then marked, including the medial and lateral joint lines, by knowing where you're at, you can very easily avoid the neurovascular bundle. It is whenever you don't mark those out and you're kind of shooting blind that you can get yourself offline and, and start missing your target. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you actually put that on the leg and, and mark it. Correct. Yes. And I, uh, so whenever you watch uh, some of the YouTube videos that I've done with the skeletal traction placement that we did on the cadavers, and you see me drawing out the patella and the joint line, we do that on, on people. We do that on our patients regularly. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
John, I got a quick question here. It mentions that you applied 15 pounds of traction weight. I'm just kind of curious the size of this patient. Oftentimes there's a 10% of body weight rule of thumb. Um, I'm also curious how long it took to get the femur in line or in position. Um, it looked like from that initial CT scan, once they were placed in skeletal traction, it was close to where you wanted it, but maybe not right away. So I'm just curious, how long does this process take to get them right where you want it to? So based on the size of the patient, honestly, he's about your size, um, you know, average height, slim build, muscular. Do you want me to keep complimenting you, Derek, or is that good enough You're for today? Some, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, but uh, no, he was, uh, he was average. Uh, and uh, so that uh, 15 pounds, it's pretty regular for us. Um, we almost exclusively use 15 to 20 pounds, um, eat regardless of the size of the patient. Um how long does it take really depends on the level of displacement and how long they've been out. So this gentleman, from the time of his accident until he had the, the traction pin placed, I'm going to say is comfortably less than three hours, probably less than two. So that's pretty short. Now, where we are positioned here in San Antonio, our hospital covers a very large geographic area. So even if patients are being flown in, they can be out for hours at a time. And we've had people that were transferred in with fractures that were greater than 12 to 18 hours old. So given the amount of contraction that they have had over that time, it's obviously gonna take longer to get that back out to length again. So there's really not a specific timeline, like you know, I can't say 10 minutes or 10 hours or anything like that, very case by case dependent. And we don't typically do x-rays along the way to watch that reduction. We don't find any utility in that. We just know that it's closer than what it was. And, and then we position in the operating room. That's good. Thank you. So helpful, John. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> do you know who put this one in? Uh, if it wasn't you, and was there any issues putting this pin in? Um, I do know who put this one in. Uh, and uh, it was... Um, I, I think it was one of the residents that you met um, that was here before. Um, and no, he had absolutely no trouble at all. Nice. And then um, I noticed that uh, this may be more of like a surgery, surgery question, but uh, I noticed that fragment in, the, in one of the x-rays, like a pretty big fragment. Do you know when those need to be dealt with uh, or when they're okay uh, to just hang out and then fuse back into the bone? That's certainly a bigger question than skeletal traction, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So you're talking, you're referring to this piece right here, kind of better seen on this one right here. Um, and what this is, this is going to absorb back in. That's what the body does. So as the body, I, as I describe it to patients, and it's extremely rudimentary and not entirely accurate, but I'm pretty close. As the bone heals, the very first thing that's going to do is grab the resources that are closest and most available to it. So this still has some tenuous blood supply. It's not great. It's far from perfect, but it is going to contain the things that the body needs to be able to grab to be able to help heal that fracture and kind of fill in that gap right there. So we leave that in place. You never, you never take out bone unless it's in the way or it's causing problem. It will always help to bridge and to, to fuse that gap if nothing else, from here to here and from here to here, and it'll just leave a hole right there, which, believe it or not, doesn't much matter. The, um, the biggest reason that we need to deal with these things is whenever they're causing skin problems. So if we need that to try and figure out length and rotation, then we'll open it up and key that in. If it's causing skin problems, we'll open it up and key it in. And I can tell you, based on these staples right here on the lateral side, we did have to open this and reposition that fragment in there to get that reduced and to get the length and the rotation correct. That's awesome. I've always been amazed at the power of uh, the human body to fix stuff like that uh, back to where it needs to be. That's so interesting. Thanks. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then just one more question. You mentioned uh, you didn't have problems with getting consent from this patient. I was just wondering what happens if you can't consent them. So usually in specifically in skeletal traction, we don't necessarily need to obtain consent. Because uh, even if you are unconsentable, like let's say that this, this young patient was intubated, we're still going to go through with what we need to do. Because who would, uh, I'm, I'm trying to word this correctly, who would wake up and say, 
who fixed me I didn't want fixed? And the honest answer is no one. So we have the ability to perform life-saving measures and procedures without consent. And this is this falls into life or and or limb. Okay. So it's like you get consent if, if the patient's able to give it, but if not, then that's okay. okay. Correct. Yeah. If, if this patient's intubated, then we just proceed. And that even includes the surgery too. But for surgery, we, we work really hard to get consent from family, from relatives, from neighbors, just to, to talk to somebody about it who knows this person. So thanks so much. Any other questions? Anything else I can do for y'all? Wonderful. If that, if that fragment was displaced too much that it wasn't uh, in the right position, do, would you ever use a wire to scrap it back onto the bone or like, no? No, no, not really. Cause you just kind of got to get it close. And the problem with putting the wires in there is that they cause a significant amount of irritation and they can actually um, act almost as a tourniquet and disrupt the periosteum and further disrupt the blood flow. And generally they just break. Interesting. Yeah. It's really hard to get a wire around bone. It's really hard. It okay. looks really easy and common sense would tell you that it, it would be easy, but it, it is not. And you have to strip a significant amount of, of periosteum and soft tissue just to get all the way around that bone. Makes sense. Uh, was it the method of injury, the, the, that kind of thing where your knee jams into the dashboard and, and yeah. your breaks? Yep. Yep, dashboard injury. I'm always moving my seat back. <laughs> Doing you a car with knee airbags. Knee that's what you need. Oh, every, every, every time I see your case of the day, that's exactly it. That's always the way it happens. <laughs> Thanks, John. It was really, really cool. Sure. All right, guys. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'll let you go. And, you know, as you go through the day, remember, we're treating people we know here. That's what we're doing, and we're making it better for them. Thanks for your time. Appreciate you, John. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Thanks a lot, John. Awesome. Absolutely.